All right. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Tabitha, and everyone at Founders for um, having me here. And it's great to see some familiar faces and some new ones. So let's talk about distraction. Turn your phones off. I'm just kidding. If you, if you want to, you can. I'm actually going to get mine out for, to prove a point here in a minute, I guess. A prop. All right. So the subject um, for my title today is Distracted by Distraction, the Problem of Paying Attention. Um, and it examines some important and complex issues that I have noticed in my teaching, studying, working at three universities, and now in my role as an associate director at the Austin Institute for the Study of Family and Culture. So at the Austin Institute, you might know, we think through philosophical and cultural questions and find avenues for sharing our research and holding important conversations. And what I will talk about today stems from what I see and others have seen as a crisis of attention. So after the talk today, we'll have some um, conversations and I'll put it up to, to, to all of you and think about your own experiences. So most of what I'm about to share is what we might call common sense. But I've heard it said that it's sometimes necessary to defend common sense with an elaborate argument. So here we go. For the large part of this talk, I'll offer a new landscape um, and the challenges in the economy of attention. Then I will provide a few possibilities in reclaiming our power of attention. To be clear at the outset, uh, this is not a nostalgic hearkening back to a time before digital screens. I'm sorry if you came for that talk. It's not this one. So about half of my lifetime has been dominated by the rise of cell phones and the internet. Uh, so for one, the deep-seated cultural and social patterns uh, that digital technology has created are unlikely to go away, um, barring some, some unhoped for cataclysm. So second, I really enjoy the affordances my cell phone offers me, my family, my friends, and our culture. So sharing information, such as a brief note or a picture, um, immediate long distance correspondence, GPS that got me here, uh, the way my airline ticket just pops up on my phone. I like knowing sports scores immediately, finding a poem or quote that I only half remembered. Um, all of this is really good. Uh, it's, it's even cool. But the main thrust of this conversation is to remember that we are looking for the tools which help us achieve our best desires, both personal and social, and that the new challenges to attention need to be understood and then responded to with a profoundly humane approach to technology. Such an approach fosters a responsible power of attention for parents, students, and just anyone who feels a little uncomfortable about their experience with glowing rectangles. All right, glowing rectangle. Also called a black mirror, which is a show now, if you haven't seen that. Okay, black mirror, glowing rectangle. All right. So uh, I want to first talk about a crisis of attention. So a crisis in attention and then what attention is. So give us kind of a working definition. So my working definition is that attention is the power or the faculty with which we grasp reality. We get the word from the Latin verb uh, attendere, which means to stretch in an effort to grasp reality. So imagine attention as an arm reaching out from your mind and pulling the world in. It's how we take in the world and directs who we are becoming. The failure of attention is the precursor to failures in other realms. This also means that the success of our attention can proceed flourishing in the ways we want to flourish. It's the kind of fundamental way we can see the world. Without it, we don't really see the world very well. So here's a question. This is a real question. Think about it. How many glowing rectangles have you looked at today, both in public spaces and private? And how often? So televisions, computer screens, and the ever-present companion, your cell phone. So apparently, my cell phone tells me, uh, I looked at my screen an average of two hours and two minutes last week per day. So the extra two, mi two minutes seems pretty excessive, I know. Uh, what about you? What were you doing? What were you wanting to do? Are you keeping track? My experience teaching in university education for the last couple of years at the Institute as well has revealed the widespread acknowledgement that we are, all, uh, we are all constantly distracted. In our Institute seminars and lectures, I meet people from across the city, across age groups, demographics, and religious commitments, and one of the main threads that bubbles up in most discussions is the profound loss of attention that plagues our homes, schools, and civic society, which is just a buzzword meaning all of us. Perhaps you know what I mean. So to be honest, uh, when people talk about distraction, the general tenor is one of complaint. 
sometimes about our own faults, but a good dose of other people's. The fussy realization that we're all kind of giving each other short shrift sometimes. So more often than not, our complaints and fears tend to focus around young people uh, who bear the weight of future's promise and today's grand and hitherto unthinkable experiment of uh, radically connecting them to each other, um, the wild west of the internet search, the newfound reasons to keep passively entertained. But in reality, young people take their cues, inheriting not only the devices, but the virtues and vices of parents and educators. So when it comes to atten attention and distractibility, the good part is we're in it, or more technically, out of it, together. So in a recent New York Times article, Casey Swartz uh, writes about the attentional crisis and the widespread affirmation from business folks to philosophers to web engineers that we are indeed a culture who just can't focus. He says that, uh, quote, one study commissioned by Nokia found that as of 2013, we were checking our phones an average of 150 times a day. But we touch our phones about 2,617 times a day. So Apple has confirmed that users unlock their iPhones an average of 80 times per day. Screens have been inserted where no screens ever were before. So over individual tables at McDonald's, um, in dressing rooms where one is most exposed, on the backs of taxi seats. And for only $12.99, one can purchase an iPhone, holster for, an iPhone holster for one's baby stroller. True story. This is us, eyes glazed, mouth open, neck crooked, trapped in dopamine loops and filter bubbles. Our attention is being sold to advertisers along with our data and handed back to us tattered and piecemeal. So consider all this visual noise. Maybe not in this room, this is kind of a nice library without sort of distracting glowing rectangles, but most of life we, we sort of encounter these. It's a sort of culture of the image, of the glowing image. So many of us might respond that managing our media intake comes down to self-control. This is kind of a dominant idea. So not touching your phone 2,000 times a day seems like a reasonable expectation for a civilized person. I get that. But what I want to point out is that this assumes that all calls for our attention exist on the same playing field, and that self-control stems from a type of willpower suitable to the challenge. However, it is becoming clearer by the day that new and highly engineered calls for our attention go beyond reasonable expectations for self-control. One common misconception is that our various technologies serve as equal avenues for achieving desired ends. So in the, in, in the sort of uh, information age we live in, we often assume that the medium, or this technology, which brings us the best information the quickest, provides the most economical resource for our time. So we sort of go with it, whatever's the quickest and best. But these views, whether we hold them explicitly or act on them implicitly, they're deeply misconceived. Even this word technology has come to mean simply a tool, and more often is thought of as just a digital medium, something with a glowing rectangle. But this word technology literally means a science of skill or art. In the ancient world for Aristotle, a techne were really considered the tools which teach us. So the, the tools which form us. That is, through our technique, through the things we touch and use, we also gain an epistemology or a way of learning about the world. It's not just a one direction, a unilateral type of focus. The things we use end up shaping us in some way that we might not understand. The Canadian pioneer in media theory, Marshall McLuhan, he declared in 1964 that the medium is the message, arguing that the technological form in which we receive ideas acts on the person just as the ideas do. He says that all media work us over completely. They are so pervasive in their personal, political, economic, aesthetic, psychological, moral, ethical, and social consequences that they leave no part of us untouched, unaffected, or unaltered. He says the medium is the massage, it means it works us over. Any understanding of social and cultural change is impossible without a knowledge of the way that media work as environments, the way technology work as an environment. That is, our tools are not merely things we use, there is a return effect that comes from how we use them. Okay, so what happens when a technology or a medium becomes less a tool for expressing our desires, but rather of cultivating them? And what happens when we don't know we're being cultivated? This all sounds like, uh, you know, like Armageddon stuff, but it'll get 
There's some answers later on in the talk, okay. So James Williams, he worked for a decade at Google, engineering high-powered information models. And then he went to Oxford to study philosophy. He's now the author of a new book called Stand Out of Our Light, Freedom and Resistance in the Attention Economy. So for Williams, the new attentional crisis involves a great problem about human freedom. He writes that, quote, the liberation of human attention may be the defining moral and political struggle of our time. Its success is the prerequisite for the success of virtually all other struggles. Williams chronicles his growing realization that his work at Google was not just about the liberation of information, but rather of offering information in order to get our attention. Attention is a limited resource, so in the marketplace, it's something that people want. So like a great number of us, he says that he felt distracted. He writes this, but it was more than just distraction. This was some new mode of deep distraction I didn't have words for. Something was shifting on a level deeper than mere annoyance. It felt like something disintegrating, decohering, as though the floor was crumbling under my feet and my body was just beginning to realize it was falling. I felt the story of my life being compromised in some fuzzy way I couldn't articulate. The matter of my world seemed to be sublimating into thin air. So this feeling of losing control, of doing something you didn't want to do, might be common to you. It's not that distraction is new, of course. It's as old as Adam. T.S. Eliot, Eliot, the poet, captures this well in his poem, Four Quartets, that we are, quote, distracted from distraction by distraction. And this was in 1943. But distraction may not really be the word for what we actually experience now. So distraction implies a lack of traction, a sitting still. Instead, we are still moving, but now we are being led into a more base and impulsive side of ourselves. Through our glowing screens, our willpower is not being simply redirected, but innervated, taken from us. In the name of seeking information, of connecting with friends, family, a community, we find ourselves being torn away from reality and from our best selves, the type of free selves we might, we might want to become. Okay, I want, now I want to sort of move in to talk about the sort of design principles around the way our attention is being garnered. The spaces in which our attention is being sought uh, after has been described as the attentional economy. This is in part called an economy because of the various ways our attention is being monetized. The goal for most content and format providers as well as the search engines which act as the highways of mediation, is to get and keep your attention. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Google, etc. Name a, a platform that you use or think about. So this is pretty obvious. On YouTube, you don't even need to click to watch a video anymore. Sure, just sit there and watch hundreds of funny cat videos to your heart's content. So according to the Center for Humane Technology and Publicly Available Data, the advent of automated video on YouTube um, quadrupled the number of video hours played from the years 2013 to 2015. So quadrupled the business in, in three years. Similar automated advertisements on Facebook and trending topics on Twitter lead to a greater participation in these platforms. It turns out that we are most pliable, most profitable, and most hungry for the next dish when the work of searching and sifting the internet is done for us. This is the logic behind an automated video or, or advertisement. So the former Google engineer, James Williams, he sees that the new online and digital cultivation of habits relies upon an army of tools to grab our attention and to profit from this. And such informational media companies are winning and it's not even close. Google's market capitalization for our attention last was an estimated um, $716 billion last year, while Facebook's was a mere $522 billion. So they rely on an unprecedented and seemingly science fiction capabilities such as artificial intelligence which predicts human interest in your eye movement, to keep us scrolling, swiping, and sharing, a redefinition of our social lives and self-esteem, and a highly personalized and micro-advertising campaign just for you that relies upon a history of everything you've ever clicked, shared, watched, or possibly said in a private conversation. So reality is stranger than fiction. The philosopher Matthew Crawford, um, he contends that the type of mental engineering on electronic devices corresponds to the type of food engineering that happened earlier in the 20th century. Like the hyper-palatable cheeseburger 
or potato chip that was developed by manipulating ideal levels of fat, sugar, and salt, we now experience irresistible, hyperpalatable mental stimuli that we are simply not well made to ignore. He says that, quote, distractibility might be regarded as the mental equivalent of obesity. The palatability of certain kinds of mental stimulation seems to be hardwired, just as our taste for sugar, fat, and salt is. When we inhabit a highly engineered environment, the natural world begins to seem bland and tasteless, like broccoli compared with Cheetos. Stimulation begets a need for more stimulation. Without it, one feels antsy, unsettled, hungry almost. In the electronic world, which is more and more often what people experience, we become types of uh, pliable consumers, more fragile, more self-absorbed, and more desiring of manufactured experiences. Simply put, it's just easier to be on a glowing rectangle than to be with other people sometimes. So much of what we, do, we consider our common culture is changing radically at this level of attention, how we are stretching our minds to grasp reality and take it in. But there's reasonable evidence to believe that such changes in attention cause and not just correlate to real changes in our views of the person in society. In a recent book by the psychologist Gene Twinge, uh, offers evidence that our virtual lives lead to failures in attention and new kinds of isolation. Her book is called iGen, Why Today's Superconnected Kids Are Growing Up Less Rebellious, More Tolerant, Less Happy, and Completely Unprepared for Adulthood. Twinge looks at what she calls the I generation, so those born between 1995, the year the internet was commercialized, and 2012, the year in which for the first time the majority of Americans owned a, a smartphone or a phone that could access the internet. So Twinge's careful analysis of national survey data checked against previous decades and generations reveals that this generation, more connected than ever, is lonelier than any generation before on record. As the internet puts down deeper and deeper roots into our lives, it alters our development in some way. Twinge sees that the lives of teens and the rest of us may never be the same again. iGens are more likely to spend uh, more time online than with their friends, more emotionally insecure and depressed, more suicidal than ever, less religious and less spiritual, more concerned with safety, uh, more indefinite about gender, sex, and marriage, and less politically committed. By and large, they are simply more disconnected, distracted, and distanced from others. Some of these statistics are stunning, and you can check the book out. A national survey, Twinge records, uh, across the last 30 years shows that in just four years, 31% more 8th and 10th graders felt lonely than in, in 2015 than in 2011, along with 22% more 12th graders. Statistically, this is a monumental shift in reported loneliness. It's the same questions asked the same students over time. Twinge wonders if there is simply a broad malaise or sadness washing over young people and that loneliness might be across different kinds of activities. After accounting for different types of leisure and connectivity between in-person and electronic communications, she writes, the results could not be clearer. Teens who spend more time on screen activities are more likely to be unhappy. And those who spend more time on non-screen activities are more likely to be happy. There's not a single exception. All screen activities are linked to less happiness and all non-screen activities are linked to more happiness. So she digs in, goes further. She says, if you were going to give advice for a happy life, it would be straightforward. Put down the phone, turn off the computer or iPad, and do something, anything, that does not involve a screen. If you're doing the math, that means that the first iGeners are now 23 years old and most likely in the workplace, in this room. They should not feel picked on here since the same traits are increasingly common among all ages. In fact, it's most likely that the young are simply taking their cues and enabled by adults. So it's a communal sort of problem. M Matthew Crawford argues in his book, The World Beyond Your Head, that the design principles that I've mentioned before, which lead to weaker powers of attention and passive engagement with the world, actually develop a type of attentional, what he calls autism. He considers the development of children who early on engage the world through a very simple exercise. Hitting a button for lights and sounds to come on. Sorry. Hitting a button for lights and sounds to lights and sounds to make something happen. Hitting a toy. Uh, so this is a much simpler design for agency, for doing something in the world, when compared to say throwing a ball or ho holding a crayon. 
And indeed, these require further development with the frustrating world and the toddler's frustratingly bodily coordination. The child's pleasure comes from repeatedly hitting the button and hearing a sound, a seamless unity between desire, action, and effect. Hit a button, make a sound. Hit a button, make a sound. An autistic child feels more distress than usual when things don't work like the closed loop of hitting a button and hearing the sound. Developmentally, an autistic child has difficulty learning to see the world through the eyes of another to get out of one's own perspective. Similarly, the closed and invariable loop of action describes much of our interaction with electronic media, and we show an increasing distress when our actions don't have immediate effects, when our desire is stunted by our technology and things get frustrating, and when other people don't do what we think they ought to. So think about the wait time between loading pages on your internet browser, or the ringing of a cell phone, the little spinning wheel that tells us we are not God of the universe. But think also of the difficulty of even mature friendships in communication, as opposed to the closed loop of electronic interaction. Think about a text message over and against a phone conversation. In one, you're in sort of complete control of when and how you respond. In the other, you're sort of at the liberty of somebody else's judgment, right? Go one step further. Imagine an in-person conversation versus a telephone conversation. So don't pick on text messages. In a cell phone conversation, you get frustrated, you can hang up, right? Well, it's different than walking out of a room. It takes kind of a bigger, bigger life choice. So there's different sort of degrees of manipulation of the world that you sort of gain with the, the more digital interface. Okay. Okay. So Crawford says that part of this autism is the inability to see one another in a relationship, to put oneself into the place of another, to cultivate empathy. At the root, the problem is that we are increasingly unable not just to look inward, but look into the eyes of another, to attend or stretch ourselves into thinking of life through another's eyes. So, so locked into our glowing worlds, we've forgotten the light of day and the brilliance of other persons. Okay, now you're thoroughly depressed. And so, I wanted to lay out some of the landscape of the attentional economy, some of the, the problems that maybe you don't know about. And if you already knew about them, there's kind of a refresher. So, I want to sort of move in now to uh, offering some suggestions or tips more suggestions than tips. So as I see it, um, some of these challenges to our attention foster lives that are more lonely, more confused, more passive, and more disconnected. So therein lies the opportunity to foster more intelligent, intentional ways to use our tools, not be used by our tools, and to furthermore recover some experiences with the tangible world and with other people. So the ways uh, that I'll sort of offer the suggestions will be kind of a range of things, um, more than just hiding phones from your students or from your children. Okay. So I want to offer a few ways to respond to our attentional crisis. One is to understand the technical landscape. Two, to cultivate a deep work philosophy. Three, to develop a craft or a skill. And the fourth is to reclaim conversation. So understand the technical landscape cultivate deep work philosophy, develop a craft or skill, and then reclaim conversation. I'll move through these now. Okay. So my first challenge to you is to first understand the technical challenges to attention. And your very presence here suggests to me that you've already begun this process or you're further along than I am. One succinctly helpful uh, website uh, for understanding these challenges is that of the Center for Humane Technology. It's a collaboration of former Google and Facebook engineers paired up with social theorists and philosophers. So it's called the Center for Humane Technology. On that website, they've gathered a short list called the Ledger of Harms, um, which has some new attentional mechanisms that you might find helpful. Another way they are helpful is showing that sometimes we may not be able to go cold turkey on digital media. And so there's a type of prudence and intelligence that is needed to come up with better alternatives and to create maybe political pressure, some type of pressure to make technology is more humane. In fact, their vision is, is to inspire um, people, young and old, to be the people that create sort of counter technologies, more helpful, more humane technologies. That's my first point. Understand the, the landscape. The second is to cultivate attention at work. Cultivate your own type of attention at work. This reflection is directed towards adults in the room, uh, the formers of the first school, 
and it's about cultivating attention in the work we do. This entails the responsibility we have to others and they to us in regards to our attention. A friend of mine tells me that in the 18th century, it was popular to have what was called a calling hour. During the social season, people would dis distribute a calling card. Therein, they might let friends and associates know they would be home during a set window, and guests could stop in for a 15 to 30 minute visit. While I'm not asking us to go back to the 18th century social norms, the practice provides an interesting insight into the changing social expectations that we place upon ourselves and others. So one book that's been really helpful for me in considering my attention at work is Cal Newport's book, it's called Deep Work, Rules for Focused Success in a Distracted World. Deep Work, that's what it's called. I have no idea uh, what Newport's religion is, but he seems to have grasped a hold of the quest for deep attention, almost in a way, uh, it's like a rule for life, almost like a religious rule for life. He's very intentional about this. His goal and mine is to be able to think deeply, work efficiently, and be available to others. In an effort to help us work intentionally, he distinguishes between deep work and shallow work. Consider your own life, what shallow work is, and how much of your day it takes up. So, email, chores, routine meetings, etc. His point is that these things are necessary, and they're fine, but they can easily subsume our days and feel like a full-time job in themselves. I'm probably not the only one that thinks email is a full-time job. Don't know how that happened, but just sort of woke up one day and that was life. But feel free to email, email, email me after this if you want to. Okay. So furthermore, uh, they're often accompanied uh, by some of the distractions I've talked about so far, um, such as the multiple browsers pulled up next to an email, so having Facebook, Instagram, the news, or something entertaining pulled up next to things that you're doing. Newport offers some very practical advice on how to drain the shallows, so we might go deeper, and I think it jives really well um, with our notion of sort of creating uh, new expectations of, um, of conversation. First, you must decide on a deep work philosophy, a rhythm of your work. For me, this has changed over the years to adapt to new demands. As a student and teacher, I remember something of a monastic discipline, where I'd go off grid for hours at a time. I didn't have text messages, so people would just call me when they needed to. I would hide my phone for hours, a, for half a day, a whole day sometimes. But now, I have to structure in 15 or 30, minute, uh, or 30 minutes to craft emails, update a web page, or settle in for a conference call. So these are scheduled internet blocks that are breaks from focused concentration. If we don't intend on a deep work philosophy, we'll be subject to the intentions of others who want to cultivate our attention. If we're not intentional, other people will be intentional for us. So in my work at the Institute, we champion real life conversations, lectures and seminars, and meeting over food. We realize that more and more folks tend to live their lives online or in isolation rather than unfold a topic with other people. We try to reach UT students who are so often trapped into polarized views on one subject or another that actual conversation and friendship has something as of a moderating effect on them. Part of doing good for these students is basically saying, just chill out, have some coffee, take some time. But we also see people from across the spectrum, such as yourselves, so working professionals, homeschooling mothers, educators, etc. One of our goals is to open people up to questions, to comments, and the presence of others in our local community to heal what is broken in these relationships. So let us think specifically about the work we do in ways to better structure our attention. Perhaps like your work, my work at the Institute entails complex obligations on my time. At one level, it is highly embodied. I get to meet folks like you across the city. On the other hand, uh, I run our, our website. And I send a lot of emails, and some are quite complicated and, and um, time intensive. Perhaps like yours, if I let it, my paid work can take up more time than I want it to. Per conversely, and perhaps like yours, I can now easily let in various competitions for my work a text or phone call to family or friends, an interesting article or video. The temptations to daydream and procrastinate have always been present in work. So let us think of intentional ways to structure our days, to make ourselves present to others and they to us. Is something like the 18th century calling hour a possibility for us? That we select a certain time of day that we make calls and texts? What would it cost us and what would we gain? Okay, moving on. My third suggestion on how to develop attention 
uh, is a supremely practical and pedagogical, but also hopefully enjoyable one in the long run. One real response to a highly mediated world is to develop a skill or a craft. In fact, try to fix things that are broken or to make something new, to come into contact with the messy reality of the material world. This is for yourselves, for your children, for those you teach. The elusive draw of glowing screens is the frictionless world that the internet and electronic media seem to offer us. But these do not stage the kinds of interactions with the world which actually make us deeply human, I would say. The philosopher and motorcycle mechanic Matthew Crawford offers a compelling history instead of responses to this attention I've been exploring. He contends that our more pliable digital interfaces, the rectangles, make us not only more self-absorbed, but basically narcissists. As opposed to the types of frictionless interactions with screens, where we easily control a world flowing from uh, Amazon purchase to set my alarm, checking scores, dropping in and out of conversations with ease, the moral significance of work that grapples with material things may lie in the simple fact that such things lie outside of ourselves. A washing machine, for example, surely exists to serve our needs, but in contending with one that is broken, you have to ask what it needs. At such a moment, technology is no longer a means by which our mastery of the world is extended, but an affront to our usual self-absorption. So I used to work as an oil field mechanic for two years while I was a student at a community college. I would fix these big lar large pipe spinners and mud pumps. And I recognized that fixing things differs greatly than the philosophical life. So the life of a student, the life of a teacher. Both of these are difficult and necessary. But I also come from a long line of piddlers. And growing up, my dad was always fixing something, from cars to HVAC, branching out into taxidermy and then to carpentry. And I find these attentive actions to be deeply sane responses to digital life, to get one out of one's own mind. What we are doing in our homes and schools that foster engagement with tangible, frustrating objects and tasks, what are we doing? So without romanticizing how to build a bookshelf, to change your oil, create stained glass, bind a book, to quilt a blanket, or snake a clogged sink, I believe that something deeply humane, sobering, humbling even, can come from learning some craft and being frustrated by the material world. That's three. Okay, the fourth is to be a friend. One of the ways to reclaim our attention is friendship. This may seem unhelpfully abstract, like some big idea, but few things, if you think about your own life, are more practical than friendship. It used to be that isolation or expulsion from a community was used as a form of punishment. As a Catholic, I see this built into our Catholic moral theology in our term excommunication. So there are worse things than physical suffering in life. And it is to be banned from the community. Ex meaning beyond or outside, and communio, which means both community and sharing. So all the bad stuff we do at the core is supposed to isolate us. But what happens when a culture begins to form, form around isolation as a default posture? Not a pregnant solitude, but an anxious isolation, even amidst all this connectivity. So what happens when our, our will is so weak that we choose isolation over friendship? In our powerful book, Reclaiming Conversation, The Power of Talk in a Digital Age, MIT psychologist Sherry Turkle provides a helpful framework for getting beyond these glowing rectangles and growing in our powers of attention. She talks about the ways even the presence of a phone can derail or distract a conversation that they act as a security blanket when silence arises, and how they're often considered an equal presence uh, to others in the room. Most people are simply on call all the time, trying urgently to be friends with everyone everywhere. But this approach to friendship often backfires into this weird, strange paradox. When we are apart, we're hypervigilant about being in touch. When we're together, we're inattentive because we're hypervigilant about being in touch with everybody else. Turkle writes that we will have to be more thoughtfully constructing our lives to be both with others and pay attention to them. In fact, there's a real need to hold each other accountable at the level of attention. Similar to this aspiration of losing weight on a diet, it helps to do so with a friend, someone to do it with you. But we should also rethink the starting point for our friendships. 
A relationship of empathy does not begin with, I know how you feel, she says. It begins with the realization that you don't know how another feels. Empathy requires time and emotional discipline. What would a culture of presence and friendship look like? So let's think about this carefully, friendship, as an antidote to isolation. What ways are parents encouraging their children to be good friends, to be a friend who is a present listener and an able conversant? There is no magic spell by which friendship can be sparked, of course, and indeed much of real friendship is something of a mystery. But the emotional disciplines of conversation are being cultivated all the time. So how can we resurrect these in our homes, communities, and in ourselves? Okay. In conclusion, and at a basic level, we operate according to what might be called a hierarchy of loves in our lives. That is, we, we prefer some good, be they events, ideas, people, over another good according to how much we afford them meaning and purpose. The complex chemistry around dopamine hits and filter loops attached to glowing rectangles still works very much the same. We choose the thing we like the most. We're always suggesting to ourselves, to our children, our families and friends, what to prioritize in this hierarchy of loves. My suggestions are accordingly efforts to prioritize more humane loves over and against vicious uses of digital, digital media. So I've tried to lay out the new challenges in our current crisis of attention and lay out four ways of responding. Understanding the new technological landscape, cultivating habits of deep work, developing a skill or craft in the material world, and reclaiming conversation. My four responses are meant to initiate some chatter in your own mind and with others. So accordingly, um, at the suggestion of, of a, a founder's parent, I'd like to um, open this topic to conversation with all of you. And um, I think actually what we'll do is something different we've done before. Uh, I have some small group questions that I think we actually might um, get in groups of, say, seven or five, whatever you want, seven. And we'll spend a little bit of time with these questions, and then we'll go to a sort of larger group Q&A, and we'll open it up to everybody else. So we'll do a uh, group Q&A, group Q see what bubbles up, and then bring that conversation to the group, if that sounds okay. All right, thank you all for your attention. Glad to be here. All right.